primary slide tray is the one on your left. And you just flip the light on and we're going. Once I finish that, just shut that light off and bring the other light on because I've queued them both up. And there's a remote tube too up there. Okay. Appreciate it.
Thanks, Michael. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Part of it is that it's just nice to see the sun. I suspect that you're starting to appreciate what we've been dealing with in New England as a regular February. It's still snowy, it's still cold, it's still gray, and there's folks with shorts and tops down, and it's, uh, it's nice to be here. A little bit of background. When I was your age, the 1960s were just drawing to a close, a turbulent time. My undergraduate work was in engineering. My first challenge coming, oh, uh, we want to we want to back those, that slide. <laughs> Little help on the AV here. Back that slide up two slides back and uh, just, uh, put the, just put it in the start position. Anyway, uh, first thing out of college was uh, an opportunity to work as an engineering consultant on the Alaskan Pipeline Project. It's a really big deal, lots of money, prestige, significant uh, benefits and salary. And of course, being a young engineer, I was excited about the challenge. We had snow depths to 150 feet in the valleys. We had earthquakes to 7.5 on the Richter scale. We had to survive and continue to operate in. We had temperatures to minus 80 Fahrenheit. We had to uh, develop 52 gate valve stations along the pipeline, which each boosted the flow of oil with a pump. And these gate valves were, were two stories high, it's sort of a big faucet that would uh, shut the flow of oil off if the pipeline were to rupture or be sabotaged so that the whole thing, 800 miles of it, wouldn't drain out into the Alaskan tundra. And we had to create emergency living survival quarters for field service engineers who might be caught there in a blizzard uh, doing uh, maintenance things and, and have to survive. We had hatches that went down 100 feet because of the snow drifts that could occur, or at least theoretically occur. And these stations had to be autonomous. And this was the significance. Unlike the, the larger pumping stations, which had crude oil crackers on site, these were considered too small to justify that kind of investment. You've got all that oil flowing by in a four-foot diameter pipeline just a few feet away from these stations, but we couldn't tap any of it because it's crude oil. It has to be broken down before it can be burnt. So we had to create autonomous power systems to allow these stations to basically survive through the six or eight months of the worst part of the Arctic winter without even being attended to. And so as a young engineer, I was given the task of accounting for every single BTU in these shelters. And we did things like fastener penetration studies. When you put a screw into a wall, it penetrates a half an inch. That increases the thermal leakage of energy from the inside to the outside. And I had to calculate every single fastener and how that contributed to the leakage because this was an autonomous living capsule. And so after these rigorous exercises, it became sort of clear to me that it was a lot easier to save a given unit of energy than it was to produce it, regardless of how we produced it. And then again, of course, there were lots of politics surrounding the pipeline project. And right smack in the middle of it, there happened to be a little geopolitical event called the first Arab oil embargo. And that was a wake-up call for me. One might call it a young epiphany. And I came back to Boston with a little bit of money and a whole lot of enthusiasm, and this is important, not knowing any better, opened my own consulting business to power buildings with solar energy. And during those days, there was absolutely nothing written. A couple of students have come up to me before the lecture and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing my my thesis on, on solar, you know, where can I get information? And I'm thinking, my goodness, there's a tractor trailer load of information out there now. When I started, there was nothing. And we began to, uh, to think about powering houses at first because that was what a small group gets to do first. You don't get to do giant projects. And that was in the early 70s. The last 20 years, 
have brought significant changes to the design profession. Against the backdrop of traumatic escalations in oil prices, war, heightened awareness of environmental impact, uh, embargoes, as we said, uh, a growing concern that, that energy resources, which are based on conventional fuels, are finite. Uh, the impact of our work as designers has been increasingly clear. And in the process, the shortcomings of yesterday's buildings have also become increasingly clear. Inefficient electrical and climate conditioning systems squander huge amounts of energy. They require large amounts of fossil fuels to be burned at power plants, releasing huge amounts of carbon-based effluents into the atmosphere. Inside, you've got healthy air quality issues with off-gassing of materials, and we've got lots of buildings that are all glass and no windows and very poor ventilation, and you know, on and on. Many of you are quite familiar with these issues. And creative architects have responded, and they're specifying increased levels of insulation and higher integrity thermal envelopes and better glass and air-to-air -air heat exchangers and improved ventilation, and they're integrating daylighting, and they're actually talking with the engineers that helped them build the building and figuring how to, how to interface controls so that the state-of-the-art electronics controls that dim the incandescent or artificial lights and integrate it with the amount of daylighting so that on the work surface you now have a uniform level of illumination which uses the absolute minimum requirement of artificial light to maintain and takes maximum advantage of daylighting design integration is very important. The first thing we have to do, though, is to get the architects to talk with the engineers. Instead of having the relay race, where the architect designs conceptually a nice sketch, gets it approved, and because it's approved, the client's invested something in it, that means that all the design decisions, at least the fundamental ones, are already fixed, because the client liked the first sketch, even though the first sketch was just sort of winged over a weekend, sort of. It's nice now, so we're going to go with it, and here it is, and here's the design developments, and here you are, engineer, or the team of engineers. Make it work. Client likes it. Make it work. We need to have a parallel process where everybody's involved, and we need to start integrating solar energy. Now, I know lots of architects, I talk to architects a lot. I do day-long professional tutorials on energy-conscious design principles and green building and, of course, solar energy. There's one up in the Bay Area in a few weeks from, from now. And the first thing I get from most architects, especially the more established ones, is, well, yeah, OK. Solar's all right, but God, is it ugly. Well, now the first slide can make sense. I have to agree that solar, can we do that? No, we, we need to. Who's helping me with the AV? This is awful in a technical school. I need the, in your, somebody go into the projector room, turn on the left projector with the light. There we go, first slide. The first solar house we did was indeed ugly. A little funky, let's say. Now, we were just experimenting with this stuff, and quite honestly, uh, we were just feeling our way along. This was the first solar house we did. You don't know whether I'm kidding you or not. <laughs> this is absolutely the first time that's ever happened. I'll just continue. We were having trouble deciding how much glass to put on the southeast and southwest, and so we sort of experimented with everything. The client on the project was really great. Uh, the interior decorator, unfortunately, committed suicide. And uh, we moved on. Actually, this house is not too far from where I live. It was designed and built by a tenured professor of architecture at MIT using salvaged materials from the local transfer station. Very proud of this house, according to professor. The next house we did had some solar energy for active power generation. It's up here on the roof edge. 
This is actually a remote hunting cabin in the uh, forests. I believe it's in northern Arizona. It might be in northern New Mexico. I don't remember. In any case, the owner decided to put four basic solar electric panels on the roof to run some lights and perhaps a radio or TV. The reason I show this is to point out that design integration is very important. <laughs> now, can you think of a worst way to do this? Is this going to stay on the building very long? Is it likely that the owner's going to be safe climbing up there to get at it? If you took these four modules and you put them on the south face of this building and canted them out at 45 degrees or so, which is the most appropriate angle for maximum harvest, you'd get more solar energy. It'd be a lot safer to install. It'd be a lot more likely to stay on the building. You'd also be able to shade the south glass in the summer to reduce unwanted gain. And more importantly, it would look an order of magnitude better, which would count for a lot. Now, this system was designed by a couple of engineers. It tracks the sun precisely. And if you look at the multi-channel channel data logger output, which is processed by a microprocessor, you'd find that it's working perfectly, gathering just as much solar energy as possible. The problem is that the architects in town formed a grievance committee and everybody next door put their property up for sale, because it is god-awful ugly. The point is, we need to integrate this stuff. Now, there's lots of reasons for looking at photovoltaics in buildings. Photovoltaics, for those of you who don't know, produces electricity directly from sunlight with no moving parts, no waste or depletion of materials, completely silent, virtually maintenance-free, and continues to do this virtually indefinitely so long as there's sunlight. And photovoltaics in buildings have a very compelling list of advantages. When I started working with solar energy in the early 1970s, the prevailing conventional wisdom of the day was to create huge tracts of ground-mounted solar electric power plants, central station type power plants in the desert, which would, of course, produce huge amounts of solar energy and feed it through the nation's transmission and distribution grid to the places that needed it most, the cities, and et cetera. And that vision, of course, had a great deal of attractive benefits, especially compared to the then conventional wisdom of the day, which was a nuclear power plant in every schoolyard. However, if you look at what it takes to create a large central station solar electric power plant, you have to get control of the land, which means usually you have to buy it, even if it's cheap, there's some money. You have a lot of site work involved in preparing it to receive these huge ground-based power plants. You've got to level the land, you've got to clear it, you've got to dig lots of holes and pour lots of concrete and dig trenches and lay miles of underground conduit and pull more miles of wire, and you've got to build structural support systems to hold these large arrays of solar panels, and you've got to put a fence around this place, and you've got to build a little building to house the power conversion and switch gear. You've got to make a connection to the high voltage transmission and distribution grid. You need a substation with transformers and switch gear, and you probably need a group of people there on site all the time to look after this thing. Now, those are all expenses, and they're all considerable expenses. And you notice I didn't mention the solar panels. The solar panels are yet above that cost, all those costs. And so if you look at photovoltaics in buildings, the land that you had to buy for the ground-based system is provided free, because it happens to come with the building. The support structure and the foundation are free. They also happen conveniently to come with the building. You also have the utility interconnection. That comes free. We have distribution panels located nicely in electrical closets on every floor. Moreover, and this is a big one, moreover, solar electric systems on individual buildings displace electricity at the utility's retail rate on the customer's side of the meter, whereas ground-based central station power plants, regardless of how they're fueled, displace 
electricity, <clears throat> really they displace conventional fuel at the utilities avoided cost. That's a factor of at least five, if not 10. And so you can see there's a very compelling e economic advantage. Photovoltaics in buildings will absolutely hit the big time long before large ground-based central stations will. But the most important reason yet, especially for you as designers, is that you can take photovoltaic elements and integrate them into the weathering skin of the structure. There are many companies that are today developing products that displace conventional building materials and become the finished weathering skin of the building. You therefore get a credit for the conventional materials that you didn't have to buy and the labor to install them, both of which accrue toward the purchase of your solar electric components. Another big economic advantage. What's most important is that you get electricity delivered at the point of use in a distributed system which has a great deal of resiliency and also sidesteps completely the costs and losses of transmission and distribution, which can account between 10 and 20 or even 25 percent of the energy value. The electrons leave the power plant. They have to be coaxed along the way to get to your wall socket. And that coaxing costs energy. You have to force them through wires and transformers. And you lose a lot along the way. 15, 20, 25 percent of the original energy value is lost by the time it gets to the consumer, depending on how far away the power plant is. Does everybody know what NIMBY is? Not in my backyard? Well, that's the response that virtually everyone, even the Republicans, will say when there's a new power plant proposed, nice coal burner, maybe 600 megawatts or so, not a really big one, just 600 megawatts. How about it? Well, yeah, we need more power plants, but not in my backyard, thank you. OK, well, most of you know about that. Do you know about NOTE? That's N-O-T-E. That's not over there either. <laughs> and then the, the sort of the coup de grace is the banana, which is built absolutely nothing, nowhere, anytime, no how. Because even though we all want more energy, nobody wants to have any of these conventional things near them. Even the Republicans don't want them near them. They want them somewhere else, out of sight and out of mind. And so if you agree that NIMBY is real, and NODE is right over there too, and BANANA is certainly relevant, and no one wants any of these anywhere near them, and since if they're not near you, they have to be near somebody else, and somebody else doesn't want it near them either, then I submit that we can't have these anywhere because they're always near somebody. That's fairly simple deduction. So if we integrate photovoltaics into the fabric of design, it becomes ubiquitous. In other words, it is so prevalent that it becomes a part of the background. And that is what is about to happen. We are on the threshold of the dawning of a new generation of architecture just as we're on the threshold of a new century. It is solar architecture. We now have the technology available by which we can harvest the sunlight that falls on the skins or surfaces of the building and power what happens inside. That is very, very exciting, at least to me. I admit I'm not objective about it. It's very exciting. I see it as the single most significant advancement in the way we generate and consume energy since Thomas Edison first lit the first light bulb in his Menlo Park laboratory. We are generating electricity directly from the sunlight that falls on the building. That's very significant. Integration is the key issue here. Now, Lots of times people say, well, you know, solar is interesting, but it can never really make any significant contribution. 
because we've got all these existing buildings out there. And I like to show this one. This is a building I see a lot. It's on the way toward Boston's Logan Airport, which I see frequently. And it's a 75 or 80 year old wood frame three story structure, which has been retrofitted after design and construction with a huge new aperture. And this is harvesting money, not solar energy. But my point here is that the engineers and the architects that say, oh, well, you know, you can't do anything with existing buildings because the engineering issues are too difficult to deal with. Take a look at this one. This is right around the corner from that last one. A very narrow building, and again, three stories, wood frame construction, huge aperture, massive wind loads, lots of dead load weight, retrofitted. And the engineers had to actually ring, can you see this, these two inch diameter steel rods that tie down into an entirely new perimeter foundation that rings the building, because if they didn't do that, the whole building would blow over. I picked an extreme case. My point is, don't let anybody tell you that you can't work with existing buildings because there are fundamental engineering issues that can't be overcome. That's harvesting money. When we have a motivation to do this, the engineering solutions will follow. Now, integration. I take you to Japan. This is in Nagoya on a side street. Typical Japanese speculative office building, although the first two floors have a parchinko parlor. A parchinko parlor is a cross between modern day video arcade and 50s style mechanical pinball. And it's an obsession in Japan. Japanese students all the way up to their grandparents will stand in line blocks around on a Friday night to get a seat at a pachinko parlor machine. And so the whole facade of this building is given over to promote the pachinko parlor on the first two floors. What's the relevance? The relevance is that this is an amazing integration of electrical and mechanical assemblies and sub-assemblies. At night, all of this stuff goes crazy. These things all rotate in different directions. The lights are going nuts. And the point is, you can integrate complex electrical and electrical mechanical assemblies into a building facade successfully if, one, there's a motivation, and two, there's a willingness to collaborate among the design team. And of course, the Japanese are masters at details, and they can pull this stuff off. Now, it's very expensive, I agree, but it was justified by the fact that it was necessary. Project client wanted it. Solar electricity in buildings got its humble beginnings at my firm, Solar Design Associates, in the late 1970s when we were commissioned by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to design and construct the world's first full-up solar electric house. This was not behind the fence. This was out in the real world in the town of Carlisle, Massachusetts, some 35 miles west of Boston. It still stands today with a rooftop of 7.5 kilowatts of polycrystalline photovoltaic modules, as well as an integral solar thermal system for domestic hot water, passive solar gain, lots of south glass, very little east, north, and west glass, a clear story for overhead daylighting, which is operable to encourage passive solar thermal siphon cooling during the summer. There's earth sheltering. There's super insulation. There's internal thermal mass. There's a dual compressor high efficiency heat pump for heating and cooling. No fossil fuel is burned on site, and this house exports a surplus of electricity to the utility grid vis-a-vis -a, -vis a net metering configuration. That was with technology that was available 20 years ago. We've come a long way since then. This is also not in sunny Southern California. This is in New England. We get about half the amount of solar endowment that you folks are blessed with here. So I thought it was fitting we did it first in New England, because then everybody everywhere else would have a whole lot easier time of it. Word spread around the world about this house. 
and we began to get commissions from private clients to do solar electric houses, which were autonomous living units in the late 1970s and early 1980s. This is one house we designed in 1979. It has a roof-integrated array of photovoltaics, a roof-integrated array of solar thermal for heating and hot water. It has radiant heat distribution. It has exterior insulation for a monolithic cocoon, very high thermal integrity envelope. It has internal thermal mass. It has lots of south-facing glass. It has sun-controlling geometry. It has a working greenhouse. It has a waste recycling system. It has its own well. There's earth on the roof and earth sheltering on the north side, which was something the client really wanted us to do. There are easier ways to achieve the same thermal goals. But these folks were very close to the land, avid gardeners and they liked the idea of earth sheltering. This house and others that we've done come as close as we have been able to get to a sustainable building. Now I say as close as we've been able to get because I'll be completely honest with you, even though I've dedicated the past 24 years of my life to doing this, I haven't designed a sustainable building yet. I think the last one that I have seen or known about that was done in North America was probably the Anasazi cliff dwellings in Canyon de Chez about 700 years ago. And if anybody tells you they've done one since then, they're either misinformed or misinforming you because this is a very, very significant challenge. A very significant challenge. But sustainability is gaining a great deal more notice. Thanks to Susan Maximin, who chaired the AIA a few years ago and made it her mission. Sustainability has become almost a mainstream, no, I can't say mainstream, but it's become very popular. And this is positive, it's very positive. But there's also some downside to it. I was recently rather discouraged to see a trade article in one of the design journals about a uh, a fairly ambitious house project that was hailed as environmentally responsive and sustainable design and lots of nice pictures and a, an impressive layout. When you read down into the text, you found that the rationale would be why this house was a sustainable house, a sustainable project. These environmental credentials were based upon the fact that it had hand rubbed beeswax finish on the woodwork and that they used granite for the countertops and work surfaces as opposed to a plastic laminate. Now, fine, stone is natural and it's nice, but if you read further, you find this stone was quarried in Italy <laughs> using diamond tools and shipped halfway around the world to be milled and polished. And the net energy investment in this stuff is a whole heck of a lot more than you would have ever had with plastic laminate. And this house uses more energy than most New England towns but yet it was proclaimed as environmentally responsive and sustainable because it had hand-rubbed beeswax on the woodwork. Now, natural finishes are fine. They're a very important part of the whole natural design process. But if you're making plutonium down at the power plant, your building isn't sustainable no matter what you put on the woodwork. In 1983, we received a commission from the New England Electric System, which is a large regional utility, to develop the first solar-powered neighborhood. And you might have thought, well, my goodness, we got excited and we went out and partnered with a developer and designed this golly gee whiz new village that was all solar-powered. And to be honest with you, that was the very first thing that crossed my mind. What an opportunity. Here's a major utility with a seven-figure budget. They're going to hand to us to create the first solar neighborhood. My goodness, couldn't we create a name for ourselves? And that went on for about three days, and we talked about it in the office. And when we all calmed down, there was a consensus that we should not go out and find the new developer, and we should not go out and design a new neighborhood. In fact, we could create or we could give to the solar field 
a great deal more by going out and finding the most average, mundane, workaday neighborhood we could and convert it. Because quite honestly, even though I've just told you it's extremely challenging to create a sustainable building, that is one that's energy autonomous and also meets the other several dozen environmental criteria, it is a piece of cake in comparison to taking the existing buildings in the inventory and going back and dealing with them. And so we actually sidestepped the opportunity to get all the credit for doing a new village and instead rolled up our sleeves and found a working class neighborhood of post-World War II ranches and went back and converted all of them to become solar electric houses. Here it is, typical neighborhood. We went, we, we took great pains to locate this. Now you'd think, well, heavens, that's pretty easy. But we wanted something that was typical of any post-World War II subdivision in any area of the country, regardless of geography or climate. These ranch burgers are all over the place, from Florida to Seattle to Southern California, it's New England, and everywhere in between. We took these houses and we converted them all to solar electricity. We found out a lot of things about solar electricity in this project. For example, you can see that the orientation isn't as critical. You've got some facing east, some facing west. Here's one that faces southeast. The most of them face south, but as the street goes around the corner, they actually face west. And that's okay. In fact, the utility liked it because instead of having a spike at the middle symmetrical around noon from south-facing aperture, we had a much broader curve that harvested more energy, more hours of the day on a community scale. And that was good for the community. And since these houses were all utility interactive, and since everybody had different living patterns, if there was a surplus in one house, it went out through the utility connection and was available to power the rest of the neighborhood. There was nothing wasted, nor was there any significant investment in on-site storage, which is a huge burden to solar electricity. Sun shines, even in California, it's only part of the day. And you've got to cover the loads at night. Utility interactive photovoltaics with two-way metering allows you to store or bank your surplus power in the utility grid. You're effectively displacing the combustion or consumption of conventional fuels on an instantaneous basis. You hold them in the bank. Don't burn them now, we don't need them. We've got solar power. And at night, when the sun goes away, then you get those kilowatt hours back. It's a very nice symbiotic relationship. And even the utility benefits, it's a win, win, win relationship, which is the kind of thing that you folks as designers have to come up with. No longer is just one win good. In other words, the building looks nice. You need at least two wins. It looks nice and it's environmentally responsive. The third win here, obviously the homeowners won because they didn't have to invest in a huge bank of storage batteries to use solar energy. The utility won because they got very precious, very expensive, very valuable peak kilowatt hours which comes symmetrical around the sun pulse. The sun pulse drives the urban utility peak demand because of the air conditioning. So these kilowatt hours that every one of these house rooftops is creating a surplus of because the folks are mainly off doing things at school, at work, or whatever during the day. The loads are down. The surplus goes to support the utility's peak demand period, which even in New England is driven by air conditioning in the summer because of the urban air conditioning demand. That's the, that's the win for the utility. The homeowner wins, the utility wins, because they get very precious, very valuable peak kilowatt hours effectively given to them, and they get to trade back off-peak or baseload power, which is much less valuable. The third win, of course, is society. Society wins because we're displacing conventional fuels. A little bit at a time, I grant you, but what I want to show you here, and it's very profound, I want to show you this. this. This picture is on our office wall 
along with all the new buildings we've designed, we're equally proud of it. How does an architect get excited about a ranch burger with solar panels on the roof? Well, this house made history in that, now some of you have notebooks and paper, at least the folks who are attentive. This isn't a test, but I want you to do some basic arithmetic with me because this is really significant. These systems produce about two kilowatt hours of peak capacity under full sun. And there's three to five or six, kilo, six hours of sunlight a day, so you get an idea of how many kilowatt hours a day they make. What's more important is that they deliver between 20 and 60 percent of the annual energy requirements of these houses. Why is there such a big spread? Well, every family is different, every house is different. Some have teenage daughters that wash their hair five or six times a day. Some have teenage sons that wash their hair five or six times. Some have electric heat, some have electric cooking, some have air conditioning, some have whatever. Some, on the other hand, really got into it. Some of these homeowners really got into it. They wrapped their water heaters, they insulated their pipes, they changed out their light bulbs. They even committed a radical political act of buying a new refrigerator. Very significant. You buy a new refrigerator, it consumes only half the amount of energy that one that was present in the early 1980s, which was purchased in the 1970s, that's 25 years ago. In the intervening 25 years, major appliances have improved so much that you can get the same or better service at at least half, if not less, the energy consumption. Very important, because we are balancing both sides of this equation. We are producing power, and we are reducing our demand. Now, I told you we got between 20 and 60 percent of the annual requirements for this typical ranch burger house from the sunlight that fell on its roof in New England. Now, at the time that we installed these systems, these 24 square foot panels produced 180 watts under full sun. Now, because of improvements in the technology, efficiency in production, increases in yield and, and, and fill factor, we can get between 275 and 300 watts from the same aperture. That means that this two kilowatt footprint would now give us about three and a half kilowatts with today's hardware. And today's hardware is about half the price of hardware in the early 1980s. I'm going somewhere with this, so please follow me carefully. Because I can submit with absolute confidence that I can take any neighborhood like this and make it completely energy independent on an annual basis with the sunlight that falls on its roof today. And that's in New England. It's not in California. The technology is here. It's off the shelf. It's proven. It's reliable. And we've been doing it for 20 years. So anybody that gives you the opinion that solar energy is neat, but it's not going to happen for another 20 or 30 or 50 years, or maybe the next generation, because that's more convenient to deal with, is misinformed. It's here already. Now, I want to review the numbers to dispel any lingering doubts, because some people are looking like, I don't know if I believe this or not. Well, the obvious one is we only use 40 percent of the roof area. And we got 20 to 60 percent of the annual electric requirements. That is, we have a surplus in the summer. We have a modest deficit in the winter. But the annual contribution is greater than the demand. I've told you that we've almost doubled the efficiency of these panels. So that gives me, instead of 20 to 60, it gives me 40 to 120 percent. OK? Now, I've also told you that the refrigerators and major appliances have almost doubled in efficiency. And so if you, if you discount that in terms of the reduced demand, you can give me maybe 50 to 125. That's easy. And now I've got 40% of the roof used. I've got 60% more area. 
So I can give you between 75 and 150% of the electrical requirements in these houses today in New England from the sunlight that falls on the roof. Any questions? Yes. Questions, what's about the cost and how long do the systems work? Routinely, you can get 20-year warranties and 25-year warranties from the manufacturers now. And that's unheard of. There isn't another building material known except possibly membrane roofing, and that's prorated. And really, if you've tried to hold a contractor to compliance with a roof warranty, you'll know where that's at. Uh, the cost of the systems, these two kilowatt systems cost about $20,000 in 1983, and they cost about $12,000 today. So for less than the price of a middle, middle uh, market car, you can have all of the energy that your house will need on an annual basis indefinitely. I'm sorry, not energy, electricity. I don't want to confuse you. Because some of these houses are heated with other than electricity. But it's still very, very, very significant. While we were in town, we did the Burger King. We had it our way. This is a, a new house we did in the early 1980s where we experimented with complete roof integration. These modules become the finished weathering skin of the roof. There's no structure, there's no roof deck, there's no conventional waterproofing. The solar modules are the roof. In the center is a solar thermal system for domestic hot water heating. You have heat rejecting clear glass for daylighting, flooding this two-story sun space with light and solar gain. The house is set into a hillside. There's earth sheltering, there's super insulation, there's internal thermal mass. There is a high-efficiency ground-coupled geothermal heat pump system to provide supplemental heating and cooling on demand. Of course, there's a huge amount of south-facing glass, very little on the northeast and west, encouraging significant amounts of passive solar gain. There's sun-controlling geometry to reduce unwanted summer heat gain. And if you look carefully, you'll see the soffit of this south overhang is screened because we encourage a significant thermal siphon flow of cooling air behind the array across the whole ridge going east-west. There's a full-sized low resistance louver. And this thermal siphon airflow takes the heat off the back of the solar modules, whilst also simultaneously cooling the attic volume. In New England, the sun shines on the roof of the building during the summer, and that's where 90% of the conducted and radiated solar gain comes from that drives your urban air conditioning demand, or your residential air conditioning demand, comes from roof gain. And if we can simultaneously cool the attic with a passive airflow, which requires no energy contribution, conventional energy contribution, no consumption of energy, while simultaneously cooling the photovoltaic array, we get a win-win situation. The solar electricity production is enhanced because the modules are cooler, and the house itself is cooler and therefore requires less electricity to drive the air conditioning. And so we benefit both ways. Georgetown University's Intercultural Center, 1984, 300 kilowatts of photovoltaics integral to the building. The university said, if you want to design this building, you will make it so that it's optimized for solar electricity, because we've decided we're going to do this. And they had a design competition. And the architects actually worked with the engineers in tandem to optimize the building's geometry to gather as much solar harvest as possible, whilst, of course, meeting the university's program requirements. A major, major milestone in solar electric buildings 15 years ago. The Swiss Parliament, which 
happens to be earth sheltered on the roof, has photovoltaics on top of the parliament building because the Swiss government wants to make a major visible statement about their commitment to this life-affirming technology. In Germany, photovoltaics have been integrated into the south-facing facade of the environmental ministry in Bavaria, as well as retrofitted to the building as sun-controlling eyebrows or sunshades, where the photovoltaics intercept unwanted summer solar gain, reducing glare, reducing the heat gain, and also, of course, producing usable electricity. In Geneva, this office building, which is the, world head, the European headquarters for DEC Computer Company, has a very interesting barrel-vaulted copper roof, custom designed, and integral to it are photovoltaic modules that replace the copper panels. If you've priced a copper roof lately, you'll find that photovoltaics are actually looking pretty attractive. Another building in Switzerland, this is a flat-roofed industrial facility where the photovoltaics have been installed sort of as a retrofit in ballasted pans where you take concrete paving blocks and put them as ballast into a shallow pan of sheet metal with upturned edges such that you make no penetrations through the roof and no hard connections to the building structure these paving blocks serve as ballast to resist sliding and overturning forces from the wind, allowing you to field large-scale industrial solar plants in a matter of days with no permanent interaction with the building. And so if you decided to sell this building, or your lease was up, or you wanted to move it to a new facility, you just simply take it off in a matter of a few days and move it. In Gelsenkirch, Germany, 300 kilowatts of photovoltaics integral with the roofs of this mixed-use residential and commercial development. A bank building in Germany where specially designed solar electric modules which have opaque crystalline cells that are spread apart to allow light transmission through the overhead glazing have been used in this winter garden. A corporate campus, headquarters for a European company, photovoltaics have been integrated into the facade of the facility, replacing conventional spandrel panels with solar electric modules. There's the south face of the facility, which is completely solar electric, and then the southeastern eastern wing and the southwest facing wing are also solar electric. And you might ask, well, what's the diagonal for? The diagonal is because when the sun goes past noontime, the south-facing wing casts a shadow. And the architect didn't want to install solar in the shadow, and so he changed the facade accordingly. There's a detail. The Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, graduate and undergraduate in engineering and architecture, the students took over the building and said, Hey, faculty, you haven't been really conscious about solar stuff, but we're getting excited about it. And guess what? We've raised enough money. We're going to retrofit the design studio, which has these precast concrete roof monitors with the north-facing light, very effective lighting. But of course, you've got all this real estate here. We're going to retrofit those. You don't mind, do you? We can use the machine shop. It's all right. And they proceeded to get the industry to donate panels, and they got with the electrical engineers and figured out how to run the wires. And they retrofitted these things. And then the next building, the architects got the cue, they got the message, and got with the program and integrated them into the light monitors. This is also on the campus. The next building they built, the light monitors have photovoltaics now. North-facing glass for traditional daylighting and an opaque panel with space between to give a delightful diffuse daylighting whilst harvesting usable electricity. A larger scale implementation of the same idea. Opaque crystalline cells about four inches square with about an inch of space between them and a slightly opaque back skin so that you get a gentle diffusion of the daylight, reducing unwanted direct glare. Oh my. Uh, that's Note, NIMBY, and Banana right here. 
This building won very significant awards. It's a world milestone. You might not get excited about it as designers. This is a building that was created and executed by Sanyo in Japan. What's significant about it is that the entire south-facing facade is solar electricity, even the view glass. After that, they got real ambitious and took the top stories of this high-rise in Tokyo. You're looking out through the photovoltaic modules. These are thin film vacuum deposition of amorphous silicon on glass where a, an XY computer-driven laser has been used as the final process step, and you can create a software program that makes holes. It's sort of like an inverse window screen pattern. The laser does this little number on the facade element. And so here's a big one. Within three years from now, architects will be able to specify facade elements that selectively tune each facade of a building to admit just the amount of light they want, this will completely replace conventional reflective and tinted glass, which ironically is made by the very same vacuum deposition process. And therefore, you won't be reflecting the unwanted solar gain on your neighbor, who in turn with the reflective conventional glass reflects it back on you, and the poor folks in the pedestrian mall get their hair singed and their shopping bags set on fire. Instead, you'll be able to harvest that unwanted solar gain as usable electricity while selectively tuning the different facades. And this stuff will be so inexpensive that you'll put it on the north side of the building as well. Because even in New England, more sun shines on the north side of the building in the summer than it does on the south side. Here's a large area, thin film glass module being worked on in Germany, which will be, is, a, is a prototype for future facade elements. In Switzerland, a millwork manufacturing facility has photovoltaics on the roof monitors and also on the spandrel area of the office. In California, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District up in Sacramento has become a world leader in distributed solar electric systems, working with their customers to field hundreds and hundreds of rooftop solar electric systems on their customers' residential and commercial buildings. They effectively went to their customers and said, we know you like this stuff, we do too, but it's still very expensive when compared with conventional electricity. And so we'd like you to partner with us. First, we'd like you to give us your roofs. And second, we'd like you to agree to help pay for the cost of this stuff, because even though it's really neat, it's expensive. We want you to let us put our hardware on your roof and also have you pay a premium on your electric bill into the foreseeable future you will not get any benefit from this electricity because it will be connected to our side of the meter because it's our system. And the electrons will be solar generated, but they'll be sold to you just like you've been buying electrons all along. Now, the uh, crusty old bean counters told the solar folks, you guys are crazy. No one's going to sign up for this. That's dumb. Well, surprise. They were oversubscribed in three days. And there's a two and a half year waiting list of people in Sacramento who want to work with the utility to have them field solar electric systems on their buildings. They get no direct benefit and they pay a premium for the privilege. A very, very significant demonstration of the fact that when you have a clear community partnership, especially between a municipal utility and its customers, which incidentally are the shareholders, very big difference. This isn't an investor-owned utility. You can achieve great things. In Freiburg, Germany, a commercial speculative office building with photovoltaics in the facade as direct facade elements, and also in the southeast and southwest facing roof. There's a detail showing the single crystal modules as part 
of a structural glazing facade, which includes view glass and operable windows. A delightful little building in the south of Germany on the edge of the Black Forest. This is a mom and pop architectural aluminum company. They develop custom designed architectural extrusions to architect specifications. That's their specialty. And they asked their architect to create an office building, which was their headquarters, that told their story. And I think the architect did very well by them. I'm not completely objective, I'll admit, but all of the company's glazing systems and options are all integrated. The shades, the photovoltaic spine, the daylighting, the overhead glazing. This is the president's office solar electricity as modules for overhead daylighting, reducing direct gain and unwanted glare whilst harvesting power and providing a diffuse amount of daylighting. And this delightful east-west skylight spine that runs the whole east-west axis of the building, north-facing glass for traditional daylighting, south-facing photovoltaics for gentle diffuse daylighting. Oh, goodness. I'm sorry. Your next oil delivery has been delayed. Back to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. I like to show this building because once I get to this point, especially with the practicing professionals, they're sort of warming up to the idea that, yeah, maybe solar sounds like, yeah, it might make some sense. But goodness, I'm still not comfortable with what it looks like. Well, until you get comfortable, and that's up to you, it's not up to me. You folks are going to be the designers who actually come up with the really clever ways to integrate this stuff. I'm counting on you. But if you're not quite there yet, you can have an invisible solar building if you want. If you're not quite comfortable, or moreover, if your client isn't quite comfortable, if they aren't wanting to make a bold solar statement, then you can have a stealth solar building. Here's the north facade of this building. Conventional metal spandrel panels. Here's the south facade. Solar electric modules substituted for those conventional spandrel panels. And if you were driving by or even walking by or even standing in front of it and you didn't know what you were looking at, you wouldn't even know it was solar. And so what you can have then is the whole spectrum. You can create a bold new design statement, the era of solar architecture, or you can create something that's very low key and unassuming. In Sweden, way, way, way north, up near the Arctic Circle, a whole facade of morphous silicon modules on a commercial building. Details showing the rain screen design with large area, morphous silicon modules. Same treatment in Italy, morphous silicon. The research library at the university in Germany, at ULIC, has photovoltaics as vertical, curtain wall and sloped glass on the southeast and southwest facades. The details showing the architect's design where the crystalline photovoltaic modules have been spaced apart to provide sort of an intermittent teasing view as you walk through the circulation pattern. In Sacramento, photovoltaics have been fielded horizontal on the roof, taking the place of paving blocks. Very low cost, very rapid deployment system very, very good for summer peaking demand. Doesn't create a whole lot in the winter, but boy, it generates like mad in the summer. Think about the tens of thousands of square miles of unutilized flat roof area bathed in sunlight every day, begging to be harvested. You can always have that coal power plant. In Europe, further north, the higher latitudes, facades, in Spain, the city of Mataro's new library, crystalline photovoltaics is the entire south-facing facade, reducing the amount of daylight, diffusing the sun. In Berlin, a custom office building as an infill in an, in an old 150-year-old block, photovoltaics in the facade of spandrel panels, very high-tech, deliberate high-tech, concept, very, very modern image the architect was trying to create here. Because this is a speculative building, it was built in a market that had surplus office space. This building was rented before it was finished. The owner felt that alone was worth the investment in the solar electric facade. Here's what it looks like 
in the detail. These are very expensive solar modules, custom designed to meet the architect's specific design requirements. The electrical bus bars are in the rays of the sun pattern. And here's what this, the building looks like <clears throat> amongst its neighbors. Very obvious attempt here to make a statement, quite the opposite end of the spectrum of the stealth solar building you just saw. And that architect went on to design some great things. This is an insurance company's corporate headquarters in Germany. Complete solar electric facade. Details of the spandrel panels. In Switzerland, right in the city center at, at Lausanne, photovoltaics are being retrofitted on the aperture of city-owned buildings. Why? Because it's there. Also on the roof of the train platforms. There have been a number of studies done in Europe that demonstrate that there's a very significant amount of unused available aperture that can be harvested in a dense urban environment, even with the issues of solar access and even with the very far northern latitude concerns of solar angles in the winter. The Greenpeace headquarters in Germany has a full south-facing facade of crystalline photovoltaics. A building in Austria, a 60-year-old commercial building, was retrofitted and refurbished. Photovoltaics as sunshades and facade elements. Oh my. I'm sorry. That's not appropriate. In England, at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, the students took up a referendum and got the attention of the administration and insisted that the refurbishment of their classroom building would include solar electricity. And so the architects integrated a very creative eyebrow, which camps the solar electric modules out at the most appropriate optimum angle, whilst creating sun-controlling shade devices to reduce unwanted gain and glare in the summer. There's a perforated soffit here. Air flows out through the top, cools the modules reduces the gain, improves the electricity, and of course, makes it a solar building. This is a house we did in 1982. It's in New York's Hudson River Valley. If you look at an insulation map of the United States, you'll find that there's a black hole in upstate New York. The sun doesn't shine there from Thanksgiving to Easter. We told our client that when they said that's where they wanted to live. They insisted, saying, well, it'll be more of a challenge. And besides, we want you to design this house off the grid. That is, no connection to the utility. So we took up the challenge. We couldn't talk them out of living there. And it's an interesting story. Uh, this is in a very small town. We got ourselves a building permit, and we were working away. And an older gentleman came on the site and introduced himself as the electrical inspector. He also happened to be the building inspector and probably was the town alderman and the school superintendent. A pleasant fellow. He asked if he could look around, and we said, sure, have, have at it. During that time, at that point, this whole roof was open to the rafters. There was no solar element there, and the construction was underway. He walked around for 10 or, 10 or so minutes. We were out here on the south side. He came back around. He said, wow, very interesting house. I don't believe I've ever quite seen one like this before, but uh, tell me, where's your electrical service connection? I said, well, sir, you see that roof there, which just has open rafters now? That's going to receive a roof-integrated array of glass superstrate silicon solar modules, which converts sunlight directly into electricity. The resultant electrons will be stored in a large bank of lead-calcium batteries and converted with a DC to AC inverter to utility-grade power which will be delivered to the house in the conventional manner. And he looked really puzzled. And after what seemed like forever, he looked at the array, he looked at me, he looked up at the roof, and I was, all things were going through my mind. What's he going to ask about near strike lightning transients or ground fault protection or EMI or radiated emissions or messing up the telephone? You know, what's the problem? What's, what are we going to get? He looked at the roof, he looked at me, he looked at the roof and for the longest time and finally pushed his hat back on his head and he said, does your mother know you're doing this? <laughs> and I told him, in fact, yeah, my mom was really a supporter of what we were up to and she was quite well engaged and, and very positive and enthusiastic and that increased his comfort, but just a little bit. And so we had to go to Albany 
Albany, as you know, is the capital of New York. It's the seat of the New York Board of Fire Underwriters, which is the most rigorous electrical and fire safety code authority in the country. I'm told it's worse than LA. And true to form, about two or three weeks later, two dark colored sedans with suitably attired gentlemen with briefcases and meters and clipboards and code books showed up. And they proceeded to spend an entire day going through this house, up and down, in and out. And at the end, just a little before 4.30, a gentleman by the name of Coombs took out a little pad and signed off, putting his hindquarters squarely on the line. And for the life of me, I can't at all understand why they signed off on this house. They had every reason in the world not to. There wasn't a thing in there that was UL labeled or certified. Everything was hand built. There was nothing you could buy in the early 80s. You don't have the catalogs and equipment available now. So needless to say, the chosen form of libation flowed freely that evening. Now in Japan, they're doing tens of thousands of residential rooftops with roof integrated photovoltaics in a government, federal government sponsored program that will last a whole decade. Japan is looking to corner the market in photovoltaics and they've decided the very best thing they could do with a win-win-win situation is to pump their resources into their own country by doing as many domestic rooftops with photovoltaics as they can. They are at the end of the end of the end of the world's energy distribution pipeline. They have absolutely no indigenous resources. And so you can understand why this makes sense to them. Someday it will make sense to us. I'm sorry? And the room is needed or the people need to go or? Okay. This is the SolarX facility in, Rock, in Frederick, Maryland. It's their world headquarters where the company's own solar modules, 200 kilowatts of them, create electricity to make more solar modules. It's the first, the world's first solar breeder. The Japanese have tile on 99% of their sloped residential and light commercial construction, and so Sanyo made this very elegant curved glass photovoltaic tile. It's beautiful. It belongs in the Museum of Modern Art. It doesn't have the, a, a slight hope of becoming a commercial product. They very quickly went to a flat panel, which is like a shingle, but it's more like a tile. And this has been, uh, for several years, a test house on Roko Island in Japan. <clears throat> the, the Europeans, of course, have a high degree of tile on their sloped roofs, and so they've been working on photovoltaic roof tiles. And here you see a tile that's been configured so it can retrofit into existing roofs by removing the conventional tiles, or it can be built into new construction. In the US, I've helped develop a direct substitute for asphalt shingles where you have a solar electric shingle that can be nailed to the roof deck. I like to ask the professionals when they think this will be here. And some of them say 15 years, some of them say 10. This won the Popular Science Product of the Year Award last year. It's here already. You can buy this. It's, excuse me? How do you wire them? There's a pigtail that pokes out the back. It goes through the roof deck. You make up your connections in the attic area. Photovoltaics is spandrel glass in Switzerland displacing polished granite panels. If you've priced polished granite lately, Photovoltaics are starting to look very attractive, and you don't get any kilowatt hours from polished granite. In Denmark, photovoltaics in tile roofs, along with solar water heating. This small Swiss village, they retrofitted the schoolhouse with photovoltaics and solar thermal, side by side, PV, solar thermal. A facade mounted system in Germany. And the great sound barriers along the Audubon in Europe, going for as far as you can see, photovoltaics along public rights of way where the land is already in the public domain and bathed in sunlight and guaranteed never to have anything built here. Electrical engineers have found interesting inductive surges as the trucks go by with a shadow, but that's okay, they worked it out. And in Germany, large photovoltaic arrays along the Audubon Huge amounts of capacity tied directly into the public grid. Along the railway rights of way, 
First of all, they have a rail system in Europe, and they have all of this land, and it's electric. They did a study in the Netherlands, a country not well known for its solar endowment, and they found that if they fielded photovoltaics along the existing rights of way where the sun shines, in other words, they aren't in a valley, they aren't shadowed by hills, they could power the entire country's rail system with sunlight. It's a pretty far-reaching vision for an integrated 21st century nationwide transportation system. Photovoltaics and skylights and integrated glazing in a school in Germany along the hallway. This delightful sun pattern varies as the sun moves across the sky. The same theme in a winter garden where you're looking up through the amorphous silicon modules. There's a restaurant underneath there and the glorious solar pyramid in Geneva where photovoltaics are articulated on louvers like flower petals all the photovoltaic modules, and this controls the amount of daylight that comes into this daylit atrium. Oh my, I'm sorry, that's not appropriate, but I would say very timely. This is one of my favorites, centuries old cathedral where the parishioners partitioned the clergy. Hey, we've got to do something about stewardship of the earth here. What do you say? Oh, we can't touch our cathedral. It's been like that since the world was made. Well, what do you do when the whole congregation says, we want to do this? After a while, you stop resisting, and you do it. And they did it, and it's wonderful. Oh, lots of these. The Netherlands, multifamily housing. A house we did on the coast of Maine recently. Energy Autonomous in Maine, Sacramento, retrofits on existing houses. The Olympic Village in Atlanta at the 1996 Summer Games, we did this arch canopy with the Olympic Village architects and the natatorium complex where all the swimming events were. Got the world's largest rooftop photovoltaic system. A building in Albany at the State University of New York, the new Center for Environmental and Atmospheric Sciences, photovoltaics as sunshades. We worked with Canon architects to integrate facade elements. And here, I think it's, it's really significant. The Swiss have made a commitment to field photovoltaics at every single elementary school in the country because they realize that the rising generation will really be the ones who have to implement this. And they want them to grow up with it on an everyday basis. The same is true in Austria, where they'll field photovoltaics at every elementary school, such as the sun sculpture. And I think it's fitting to close with this last slide, which is 20 kilowatts of photovoltaics vertical to the west and 20 kilowatts on the other side vertical to the east on this church steeple in a small Swiss village. We have the technology. We need only to use it. That's up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. How would you say, where's somehow the, the leading part in the whole world in this kind of... Uh, the Swiss. Yeah. Yes, because of Chernobyl. Chernobyl, when you're told you can't go outside and your children have to wear brain slickers during the day and come home right after school and you can't eat your vegetables and you can't have any wine or cheese, the grapes have to be thrown away, it gets your attention in a way that few other things can. The Swiss passed a 10-year nuclear moratorium and made a commitment to field 50 megawatts of distributed photovoltaics immediately after Chernobyl. And they started 
a whole revolution. It spread to Germany, it spread to the Netherlands, it spread to Scandinavia, it went across the channel to England. Uh, it's very significant. Even Italy and even, even France. It's, it's nuclear yeah, madness in France. The, the cost there, because back home, the, is, if you have a client for a thermal house, they still normally refuse because uh, it still costs right, more. But there are very significant subsidies now. What's happened is the citizens yeah. have petitioned the municipal utilities and have said, we want you, we are voting, we are telling you, mandating you to add a very small amount on everyone's electric bill. You know, this much a month from everybody. It goes into a pool and it's millions of dollars. And then people can install with their own money, install these systems and be paid $1.50 a kilowatt hour for the output. And so it requires them to keep the systems operational and optimum performance, but it pays them handsomely for their pioneering initiative. And photovoltaics are proliferating like crazy. And city after city after city after city are passing these sort of community grassroots initiatives. Uh, now, of course, Greenpeace is over there. And Greenpeace is pushing very hard, well, very know. successfully. But I've heard last year in another lecture where they have built the first buildings where they really think that they can get the costs back over the whole way. Well, keep, really keep in mind that Europe has no sunlight. Yeah, I know. We, you, you folks don't appreciate what kind of resources are here. You have a factor of three times more solar resource than 50% than of Europe. And so uh, they're doing it because they are doing it. They believe in it. They, they have an environmental fervor, which is principally the result of Chernobyl. It's, of course, been driven by other things, but that's, that's primarily what it's all about. And thank God they're doing it, because the Swiss are clever. And, and they've come up with some very good ideas, which have, which have driven the, uh, the other architects, the Germans and, and the Dutch. The Dutch are now going like crazy. And without the Swiss to provide examples, there would never be any success stories to show. Half of the, half of the projects I show are in Switzerland. Another year, we'll have some very exciting ones here in the US. But be between now and then, I, I have the German and the, Jap the, well, the Japanese are doing things too. But thank God they're doing them. I agree. I agree. It's a reach. But what you're, what you're saying then is you're just further emphasizing how much of a challenge it is to make a building that's truly environmentally responsive or sustainable. because. The sunlight is so meager in comparison to the intensity of the energy requirements that it's very, very, very hard to, to get that amount. It's, it's not easy. So the things I've been showing you, especially our own work, it's like the Wright brothers. You know, you've got this rickety little airplane, and the few first ones didn't fly very well. And you know, finally, they, they got things going, and they got off the ground. It's really up to you folks as designers to get creative. You've got the next 20 or 30 years. I want